what, what they have been doing is, is trying to use a creative interpretation of the power of the grand jury to harass and intimidate government officials. Uh, one of their members is a man named Walter Fitzpatrick in Tennessee. He has been trying to get an actual grand jury in Monroe County, Tennessee, to charge President Obama with voter fraud for the 2008 election. Uh, when that didn't work, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald then accused the local grand jury foreman of violating state laws, and he decided to conduct a citizen's arrest of the local grand jury foreman. He did it on April 1st, no joke. Mr. Fitzpatrick got some friends to come along and block the exits to the courthouse, reportedly. They then confronted uh, the grand jury foreman, and of course, he filmed it and posted it on YouTube. You are under arrest. Please leave room. Placing you under arrest, Mr. Petway. You are under citizen's arrest. I am placing you under arrest. I ask you to leave room, sir. Now come with me. I ask you to leave room. I have it. Will you escort this gentleman out of the room? Mr. Petway is under citizen's Out. arrest. Instead, it was Mr. Fitzgerald who got arrested. He spent several days in jail. He was charged with disorderly conduct, inciting to riot, disrupting a meeting, and resisting arrest. Uh, after Mr. Fitzgerald was arrested, one of his fellow American grand jury comrades, can I call them comrades? Uh, he posted this rather melodramatic plea on YouTube. He did this for us. What do you intend to do for him and for this country? If we don't come to his assistance, if we don't get to the courthouse, if we don't call him, if we don't walk and march on that courthouse and that sheriff's department, we don't deserve the freedoms we have. I know what I must do. I know what I must do. Among those who answered that very self-important call uh, was this gentleman. His name is Darren Huff. He is a member of the Oath Keepers, and he was, until quite recently, a chaplain of the Georgia militia. According to a local newspaper, the Daily Times, Huff reportedly bragged to a local bank manager in Georgia that eight or nine militia groups were planning to be at that courthouse in Tennessee at Mr. Fitzpatrick's trial. He said they would, quote, take over the city. The bank manager told the FBI, and when the FBI visited Mr. Fitzpatrick's, uh, um, excuse me, Mr. Huff's house, he told them he planned to show up at the courthouse with his Colt 45 and his AK-47. But he reportedly said he would not commit violence unless he was provoked. When Mr. Huff drove into Tennessee the next day, he was stopped by state troopers for a traffic violation. He allegedly told them he planned to take over the courthouse unless not enough people showed up to help him. Uh, that day, off officers reportedly observed, quote, numerous individuals in possession of openly displayed and concealed firearms in the area around the courthouse. The next day, uh, Mr. Huff appeared on a radio show. He said this. He said, well, I mean, we've just gotten reports that AK-47s and stuff like that are going to show up. And I said, oh, like the one in my toolbox? <laughs> I said, I've got one. I said, it is legal. And I said, it's got, I don't know, I've probably got 300, 400 rounds in the truck. When the FBI heard Mr. Huff boasting about how much he was excited to bring his weapons to this thing that he had planned to take over by force, uh, they reportedly decided that Mr. Huff had both the means and the intent to carry out his repeated threats of violence. They arrested him. They charged him with traveling across state lines with a firearm with the intent of inciting a riot. Mr. Huff is now under house arrest. As for Walter Fitzpatrick, Mr. Citizen's Arrest on YouTube guy, um, He's awaiting a grand jury in June. Not a grand jury. Someone man the North Korean torpedoes. Joining us now is former ATF special agent in charge of the Nashville Field Division, James Cavanaugh. During his 33 years with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, Mr. Cavanaugh worked on high-profile cases including Waco, the Unabomber, Eric Rudolph, and the 1986 bombing at abortion provider George Tiller's clinic. Mr. Cavanaugh, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Thank you for having me, Rachel. Um, as you can tell, I both sort of take these groups seriously and find them scary and find them hilarious. Um, I wonder whether or not you think, th where you think these groups fall on the number line between uh, funny and scary. Well, that's the test for law enforcement is to sort that out. You know, the free speech, the ridiculous speech, the crackpot speech, and these uh, theories about UN invasions and uh, government New World Order takeovers, uh, FEMA concentration camps, if you will. All that crazy and uh, lunatic talk, but 
uh, if it leads to some violence, and you know, in the past, some of that talk has led to some violence because uh, members spin off and you know concoct a plot to bomb a federal building, attack the IRS, uh, shoot federal officers or police, and so violence can come from the lunatic fringe, and uh, we've seen it time and time and time again. So it can be very dangerous movement. In terms of the lunatic fringe organizing itself, looking at groups like uh, the American Grand Jury or the, the Oath Keepers, um, are these groups novel? Um, I wonder if they are more easily formed because of the organizing power of social media and the internet. Uh, or do we see groups like this ebb and flow over time, and there's always been organizations like this, whether or not they've gotten a lot of mainstream media attention. Well, you've hit the nail on the head, really, because they have ebbed and flowed, and they used to print a lot of newsletters back in the old days that they'd mail around. But the web really has strengthened these sort of lunatic groups, and it's also strengthened, uh, you know, international terrorist groups and cells. It cements them together. It makes them understand that there's a population of like-minded people like them, uh, gives them support, gives them, you know, ways to meet. So social media does strengthen them. Of course, the right-wing lunatic extremists in America that are these violent any government groups, sovereign citizen groups, they're sort of on a high roll now because of the things that are driving their movement. Uh, the economy's bad, that helps them. The immigration issue they exploit tremendously. The web has driven them. And certainly in a Democratic administration, they seem to pop up. We saw them heavy in the 90s uh, when President Clinton was in office, and now they seem to be back pretty heavy now. And uh, we're having a lot of activity around the country. Uh, just two years ago, we took off the Alabama Free Militia and they were saber rattling over, uh, you know, the UN going to invade Alabama, and we uh, undercovered them while they were building hand grenades where they were preparing for the UN to come. You know, the UN's not coming to Alabama. Uh, they don't have an army and navy. They don't even have a boat, and uh, they couldn't take over the senior citizens' home. And so there's no need to make hand grenades to prepare for the attack of the UN. But these people talk amongst themselves and get so wrapped up in these crackpot theories. Uh, about FEMA concentration camps and you know issuing writs and arrest warrants and grand juries that they become dangerous and uh, really it's better if if you have a loved one that's associated with a group like that or you are you need to break off and uh, try to get a dose of reality because that's really way out there on the fringe. In, in terms of that last point that you're making though I feel like this is something that uh, I, I keep coming around to. The more I report on groups like this and even look at the history of them and some of the tragic history of them, are there success stories? Are there mitigating factors? Are there instances, are there, 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 there patterns of behavior that lead to instances in which responsible figures in these movements say, I'm, I'm okay with our ideology, but I'm not okay with potential acts of violence, or I'm okay with everybody in my group except for this guy who I think is taking this stuff literally and is maybe going to do something that, was, that we're all going to regret. Are there things that these groups can be encouraged toward, essentially to make the more responsible members among them keep everybody safe? Well, exactly. I mean, you're talking about profiles and leadership courage here. I mean, there's been a few rays of sunlight here recently where leaders have taken on that mantra to say, you know, there shouldn't be any violence. There was one example of a uh, uh, group in New Hampshire uh, where the leader of the uh, Tea Party said, we're not going to accept any of these bigots and hate uh, signs and hate people here, so you need to go away. So there's a person who stood up you know, for the right thing. We saw both Speaker Pelosi and Leader Boehner condemn violence against Congress when there was some congressmen's uh, offices uh, vandalized during some recent uh, bills on the Hill. And I recently saw Senator McCain in the news where he said we want a re revolution, but we want a peaceful revolution. And that's what America's about. We cannot like the, the way the government's spending the money. We cannot like what they're doing and we can change them through the ballot box. But when you go off into the lunatic fringe, or the tassels on the lunatic fringe, who are calling for blood, and the blood of tyrants, and you know driving their planes into the IRS, or concocting a plot to bomb a federal building, then we're way off the charts here. And uh, really, you're acting just like our foreign enemies. The fact that we gotta spend time and energy you know, working cases on our own people who might you know, do violence against us, it's really, really sad.